Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Assisted living seems like the solution to everyone's worries about old age. It's built on the dream that we can grow old while being self-reliant and live that way until we die. That all you need is a tiny bit of help, Lance, just a little bit. That you would never want to be warehoused in a nursing home with round-the-clock caregivers. Mm -hmm. This is a powerful concept in a country built on independence and self-reliance. The problem is that for most of us, it's a lie. And we are all complicit in keeping it alive. Mm -hmm. All of what I just read is from an article, opinion article in the New York Times entitled, How Not to Grow Old in America. And it brings us to the central question of today's program, is assisted living a lie? Now, why do you care? Well, let's start with this. There are 47.8 million people as of July 1st, 2015 in the United States, age 65 and older. Of those, at least 2.39 million live in an assisted living or nursing home facility. However, this is important to know for you young people, the projected population of people age 65 and older in 2060 is 98.2 million, Mm. more than doubling. In this group... Uh, will comprise nearly one in four U.S. residents. Of this number, 19.7 million will be age 85 or older. Wow. So uh, it's going up and going up sure. fast. And that's why I give you the two Our numbers. Our population is getting older, is aging. Our yes. population is aging. So you care because at some point you'll probably be old and you'll, before that, probably know people that are old. Or your parents will be old or your aunt mm-hmm. or your uncle or your... Your grandparents. I mean, we all deal with the elderly. I mean, we were talking earlier with Caleb and and and, and talking about even when I was five and six about how you know I had a, a daily conversation with an elderly woman and and the give and take between a five year old and an eighty two year old. You know, and how my parents played a role in that and developing that and the care for the elderly. So, yes. And unfortunately, sometimes we think we're putting them in places where, well, we don't have to take care of them anymore. And that's a, that is a societal change. You know, both of my moms are, you know, both sets of my mom's grandparents died at home. Right. With, with the child and the, the taking care of the in-laws and her own parents, you know, and so death was at home. It wasn't in a hospital or in a nursing home. It was something that you dealt with as a young person. Because the people were living at home and the family was taking care of them. Things have changed uh, quite a bit. And the article actually notes early on a history point. Originally designed for people who were mostly independent, assisted living facilities have nearly tripled in number in the past 20 years alone to about 30,000 facilities today. It's a lucrative business. Investors in these facilities have enjoyed annual returns of nearly 15%. Over the past five years, higher than for hotels, offices, retail, and apartments, according to the National Investment Center for Seniors Housing and Care. So, there we go. How much money can we make off of this that's industry? Right. It's and a notice, big business. And not to 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 bang home the boring and the mundane, but we're talking about assisted living and not nursing home. And sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, and they are two very different uh, pieces of elderly care. Correct. And part of the problem is the lack of regulation. Nursing homes are regulated and inspected and graded for quality. The federal government does not license or oversee assisted living facilities, and states set the minimum rules. Super important there. Did you just hear that? The federal government does not license or oversee assisted living facilities. Nursing homes are required to have medical directors on staff who review patient medications regularly, while there is usually no such requirement in assisted living facilities. Correct. So there's a big difference. I mean, if you just think about the words themselves, Mm -hmm. they tell you what you need to know. Assisted living versus nursing home, right? right? You're not necessarily getting medical care in an assisted living facility. Right. You're responsible for your own meds, taking your own medications. There's nobody checking on you and taking your blood pressure, 
you know, checking on your diabetes or whatever, you're supposed to be able to do all of that yourself. Well, and part of the problem is becoming the lines are starting to blur and you have assisted living facilities that, and I, I, uh, know this relatively well because Brett has worked in a handful Mm -hmm. of them. Um, he's worked in the nursing home and assisted living facilities. And one of the big things the staff doesn't like often is that the assisted living facility has people living there who shouldn't be there because they need more than the staff is legally equipped to handle, let alone actually has the infrastructure for, but they're not supposed to handle it. You know, but a nursing care facility costs more. Right. So families or insurance, you know, whatever. And has the stigma associated with a nursing home. Right. You know, people don't want to go to a nursing home. Right. Um, And and then that goes to that there's such a wide range of assisted living facilities and what it means. You know, some are much closer to nursing homes in terms of what they provide and some are super far away from that. Mm -hmm. My grandmother lives in a senior living community that probably from a Census Bureau standpoint falls in the assisted living category. Right. But the extent to what they do, I mean, they have no medical staff at Mm -hmm. all, none. And they clean your apartment once a week, you know, right. and they make sure that there are meals in the, I hesitate to call it a cafeteria, the dining room, you know, for you. Right. Um, and you so, can choose whether or not, and you probably have a little kitchenette or yeah, in, in your room. You have a kitchen. And you can cook your own meals. Kitchen, But they stove. do provide three meals and usually cookies or cupcakes or something mm-hmm. that, you know, a, a bowl of fresh fruit Yep, that the... Uh, people can go down and right. help it's more, themselves. It's more like living in a hotel where you've paid for meals. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, that's what it is. And you, you don't have the have, option of whether you want to use it or not. Yeah, you don't have to and use And you're still it. responsible for your own laundry. Like you said, they come in and clean for you. Right. And that's, you know, you bathe yourself, you, yes. you know, all of those things. Now, some people there choose to pay somebody not part of the facility to come in and do further assistance. Right. But the facility makes it clear that that's not- That's not part of your monthly right. payment to the facility. Yes. So, but then you have the other side of it where at one of the facilities that um, Brett, my fiance, has worked at, mm-hmm. they've got a lot of people who, you know, are definitely in a full care state- who should be in a nursing home who are not, you right. know, and they regularly accept people. Now that's a more of an administrative problem of, you know, we want, we'll take the clients. And we're not here to talk about the process of how you should get those people out of there because, or maybe we are, I don't know, at a health risk because they're not going to get the kind of care they need. Right. And it's not, you know, that's, and it's not the staff's issue because the no. staff isn't supposed to be giving them medical care. Not the type they need anyway. And that's, But I think that's part of this because often part of what happens, I think, is with the misinformation out there, people choose an assisted living facility because they think somebody will be happier there, you know, and they may be happier there, but they're not happier if like, as this article points out, I mean, there was a lady that got attacked by an alligator and killed Mm -hmm. when she wandered out of her assisted living facility because she has dementia. Well, there's something, you know, you know. Assisted living are not supposed to have people with dementia. And it says in the article something like 40% of all assisted living patients are in some stage of dementia. Yep. More than 40% of people in assisted living have some form of dementia. We're not, we're not, this isn't, you know, this isn't apples to apples, you know, oranges to oranges. We're, we're putting people at risk by not putting them in the proper facility. Again, either A, because of insurance or because of family cost. I don't know. I mean, what else is there unless you're just not knowledgeable and you're trying to get rid of the elderly person that you feel responsible to take care of? Well, like the article points out, though, in the beginning, the irony of assisted living is it's great if you don't need too much assistance. If you don't, the social life, the spa-like facilities and the extensive menus might make assisted living the right choice. But if you have trouble walking or using the bathroom or if you have dementia and sometimes wander off, assisted living facilities aren't the answer, no matter how desperately we wish they were. My introduction to them is that If you're in an assisted living facility and all of a sudden your care demands become higher, then the administrator comes to the family and says, you have to find a new place for them by X date because we cannot provide, we do not provide these services to your individual. And so then the family has to go look for someplace um, that will take care of the situations for their individual family member. 
So, so they, I mean, you can get kicked out. You just don't get to stay there just because if, if your needs supersede what the assisted living home will do, then you, they, they tell you you have to go somewhere else. You have to make that go to a nursing home or whatever you want to call it. Half of those residing in assisted living facilities in the United States are over the age of 85, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the trend is accelerating. Most residents of assisted living need substantially more care than they are getting. And, and so the reason that we bring all this, this part of it up is understanding the difference is important in understanding what the all other options are. And part of what we're going to look at next, Lance, is um, – so we've got three articles that we're referencing mm-hmm. today. This first one, How Not to Grow Old in America, which actually brings in some solutions that we'll talk about in the last bit of the show. But the next part we want to talk about is how some less common ideas of how it's done in the United States today have been successful for some people um, and some of the upside maybe of getting mm-hmm. old, not just the downside – um, because this really is more about, you know, it's it's not just about what people want. That's a big part of it. But it's also about what they need. Right. And what you want for them. You know, uh, when somebody makes it to the point where they can't take care of themselves, yeah, it may cost more money, but it may also be what they need. And that's part of this discussion is what you don't want um, because there are and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because they're gruesome and they're sad. You know, but the, this article, How Not to Grow Old in America, tells several stories of people who died. I mean, we're not, you know, they well, I've always, they died not of a medical, you know, they didn't die because it was their time to die. They died because they escaped of something that the was facility. Preventable. Right. They died of something totally preventable if they had been in a facility where they got the type of care that they needed. Uh, and so part of talking about is assisted living a lie is understanding what assisted living should be um, and the multifold problem of the people, the family, putting people in facilities they shouldn't be in, in the industry, accepting people they shouldn't accept. To get the money, to make the profit, to keep their investors happy. 15% returns over five years. I mean, it's a good investment, Lance. Mm-hmm. Makes me want to invest in assisted living facility. I don't know about you, but 15% over five years well, is all I can say is that good. In my lifetime, I've always said a good barometer of a society is how they treat their young people and their elderly. And the problem is not going away. I mean, remember at the beginning, 98.2 million people by 2060 will be age 65 and older and will comprise about one in four Americans. So keep that in mind. You can follow along with these articles at thestateofus.org, thestateofus.org. We've got plenty more to talk about, and we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. 47.8 million Americans are age 65 or older, according to the United States Census Bureau in 2015. The group accounted for about 15% of the total population. Here's the kicker, though. By 2060, Lance, people age 65 and older will make up about one in four Americans, or 98.2 million people. Uh, So there's a decent amount right now. But it's going to skyrocket and yep. uh, people are living longer. And part of people living longer is talking about how are they living longer, right? Um, and I don't mean uh, necessarily from the medical standpoint. I mean, what is the quality of their life as they're spending more time on this earth? Um, well, and are my only choices going to an assisted living facility or to a nursing home? And they are not the only choices. Are there other options? Are there other mm-hmm. Are there other ways that people are living out their quote, so-called golden. Well, because the title right is, is assisted living a lie. Notice we don't say assisted living facilities, right? Right. Because there's other types of assisted living. You don't necessarily have to be in a formal facility. And that's part of what uh, Lance is going to share with us. Well, both of these articles and both of these stories are from the New York Times Sunday, September 1st, 2019 edition. Um, And the first one is entitled From Home Wrecker to Caretaker. And it talks about uh, it's from the viewpoint of a, of a young lady, um, who is now a mother, but she goes to visit with her uh, children, her two children, goes to visit her father, who is in his eighties. And what happened was 25 years ago, her father married a student 
And, and she goes on and she talks about, you know, was this, you know, was her father at fault? Was the young student at fault? And, um, of course, you know, she can never call this woman her mother because she had always sided with her mother because as a daughter, as a young woman, as a feminist, my mother was strong, but this hurt her and it hurt my family. But as she goes on to discuss this one day, this visit to see her aging father, my wife's, my father's wife returned to scooping oatmeal into his mouth. I sat by his feet. Over the years, his wife has never asked for help, ignored my many offers, and now we're entrenched in a place where it's less awkward if I don't offer, and I wonder if I should have tried harder. So she's going into the idea that, you know, she's looking at this, and she's allowed to come visit her father every Sunday afternoon and go out to dinner with him and have her children kind of get to know her father, but her father's in a wheelchair, needs to be fed, needs to be bathed, and she doesn't have to do this. She can go on as a young mother, go on with her life, and she doesn't have to deal with this because her father is married to someone who is, you know, 25, 30 years younger than him, who has the ability to Take care. And she says, I don't fault my father over this. He was dissatisfied. My parents' marriage was one I never understood. She nagged. He yelled. They fought. She ignored. The difference between them, I think, was this. My mother never expected a life of happiness and fulfillment. My father did. And she goes on and she talks about the good times that her father had as a 60-year-old with this former student and how they shared a love for math and science and talked. And she says, though, but I, I stepped back and I watched the two of them interact, the 80-year-old and the 50-year-old, you know, who have been together for 25 years now. And she said, she doesn't seem bitter. She's, t- she's weary, yes. And sometimes her voice grows thin, but even sharp. But there remains a gentleness to her touch as she reaches to adjust my father's baseball cap or gray wool socks or the dark glasses on his face. When they sit on the couch, her body touches his. She could put him in a facility, hire a full-time nurse, a roster of home health aides. They have the money. But she doesn't. Around dinner time, my eight-year-old asked to go to the Chinese buffet, like always. It was cumbersome getting my father into the van, though she has a practice system. Right foot here, left hand there, up, mind your head. Okay, the seat is here, relax. Before he relaxed, she was bearing every ounce of his weight. So he has this, quote, younger wife who is now an older lady, but she is still capable of caring for this woman's dad. And then she said, I keep thinking how wisely he chose, how lucky I am. If it wasn't for her, it would be me. But as a caregiver, I have none of her grace because she's a young woman raising her family, a young mom and everything else and trying to work. Hurried and busy and a lot of her time, I mean, it rightfully so, is devoted to caring for her children. And I'm going to end with this and then we can, I've got a question or two for you, but it says, however scorned or unsightly their marriage has taught me, Don't be so quick to judge. She, referring to her dad's second wife, she stands tall, proud, resilient, for better or worse, until death do us part. This is love, undeniably. And in parentheses, I'm sorry, Mom. This is love, deep in the trenches, worthy of respect, admiration, and gratitude. She acknowledges the fact that her father needs a lot of care, and then She looks at the woman who she doesn't want to like because she broke up her family, but she can tell that this woman over the last 25 years of of marriage loves the man that she calls her father. And she's grateful for this woman because she can do things for her dad that she doesn't have the skill set to do. And it would make her life even harder. And she's grateful that she knows her dad is in good hands to get the loving, caring devotion that she wants for him. Which, you know, her original mom never did even in marriage. So it's it's kind of just a different take. You know, it's like kind of going back to the old days, like I was telling you, you know, we were talking earlier in the show, where 
people took care of the elderly in their home. Now, in this case, this elderly man broke up his first family and, you know, married a younger woman, but now she does love him and she's able to take care of him. Now, right. what, you, what we don't talk about is then, though, when this older man dies, who's going to take care of his younger wife? You right. Know, because she's on her own. But it's a, but it's a different, you know, I don't know what, you know, what's your take on this? I mean, I, because we look at it like, oh, you know, and she goes in and it talks about in the article and you can read it. It's online. You know, she goes into, was it her dad's fault? Was it? You know, this young student making a play on the old man and, you know, and also, but obviously whatever the reason was for the start of it, it's ended up in a very loving relationship. I'm not sure it matters the reason for the start of it. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, um, and I understand why the child may want to understand why it started. But I think the the key is the ending there, right? I'm I don't think it matters why or how it started. What it's resulted in is twenty plus years of happiness for two people and somebody who's probably getting better care and is much happier than they would be if they were in some other sort of facility. Mm -hmm. And I and to me that's you know, that's what it comes down to. And maybe even if they're not getting better care, if if they are happy and getting care that prevents them from being in pain, you know, I think that's the key. And that's part of what you have to weigh that I think is so tough is, um, and this is where today, and part of what we'll talk about in the solution component, this challenge of putting the burden on the children. And that's not to say it shouldn't be, right? I'm not saying that um, kids are absolved of taking care of their parents, but it is it is different. A lot of households have two parents working full time, you know, uh, and if they've got kids, they already are getting help to take care of the kids, you know, mm -hmm. in most cases. There are homes that don't do it that way. True. And, and this isn't a judgment about and, one's and nobody's, better than the other. nobody's saying one's right and one's wrong. Right. We're just giving you different examples of, of how a situation can be dealt with. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing you have to look at is the practicality of doing this too. So- when we see other relationships from the outside looking in and we make our judgments about here's somebody, uh, you know, who's got somebody taking care of them, who's 20 years younger, yada, yada. Um, we've made all our judgments, you know, uh, I don't know. I think society would be better off if we just avoided that type of stuff. I don't think it's wrong to try to figure things out because I think that's as humans, we're naturally curious animals. And we want to understand how things work. I don't think that's wrong, but mm -hmm. we have to fight the urge to make assumptions um, that something's bad or that somebody's after something in particular um, until we have, you know, more of the details. And I think that's what this shows is there's other ways to do it. it you don't have to go into assisted living facility. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about the other one, Lance? Sure. The other article um, is on page 12 in the same section. And it's entitled, Her Husband's Mind is Faltering, Their Love is Not. And just very quickly, <clears throat> it's about um, a couple that she was 43 years old and had never been married before and had spent her life being a dedicated kindergarten teacher. Her husband, who at the time, who is 10 years older than her, so he was 53 at the time, um, had been married three times and they got married. And then the summer after their 30th wedding anniversary, he kept asking her over and over again, will you marry me? She goes, I've been crazy for this guy for over 30 years, but I just couldn't bring myself to say yes, because as I told him, quote, we're already married. Because five years earlier, he had been found to have vascular dementia. So even though they were husband and wife, he didn't recognize her as his wife, but he knew that the, he was in love with this lady and kept asking her, to marry him. And she goes on to talk about, you know, how do we go on? Because when he was discovered with dementia, there was no more reciprocity in this relationship. How do we keep this marriage together when the other half is now a completely changed person? We used to be joint decision makers. Now everything has fallen on my shoulders. The man who was once my rock is now my full-time responsibility. And again, as I'm thinking about this, he looks at me and says, marry me. I hear these words over and over again. And she finally says, how can I resist? I said, yes. 
And then it talks about them inviting their friends and with the understanding that, you know, don't expect things to happen like you would think they would because we don't know with his dementia what state he'll be in on this night and this day right. that we're going to get married. Um, but then she goes on and says, the night could not have turned out any better. Um, recommitting to the promises I made so long ago was an emotional moment, tender, poignant, and reflective. Our marriage vows have been tested and the center still holds. As we crawled into bed late that night, I was still floating. I said, I love you to Kurt as I closed my eyes. Reaching for my hand and placing it over his heart, he whispered back. And I'm getting tears in my eyes, folks. This is, <laughs> this is really touching me close to home. All right. Um, so I'm sorry. A- and he says, the feeling is mutual. Those are the most romantic words I have ever heard. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's just, you know, I think it goes ha- having been married for 37 years. Um, and you know, seeing this, it's just, again, they got married later in life. And and yet one is struggling, but the other one's still showing that they care for that person, even though that person isn't always there. Right. In the way that they remember them, there's still that love and devotion to each other. I mean, even though he doesn't remember her as his wife, right. He knows he really cares about her. Loves this lady and, and wants to marry her. Yep. You know. Again. <laughs> again. I mean, even well, though he doesn't realize it's again, you know, for right. him, it's but the first isn't time. That neat? I right. mean, I, it just confirms just because you get old doesn't mean that your life has to be old. I don't know. That's I guess what I take away from it. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's the idea that you know, you can still have a full life and even if you're living with dementia, you know, he he was made incredibly happy by a woman who said yes to him, who he decided that he loved. And it's as simple as that, you know, even though they were already married, even though she remembered everything and he didn't, he fell in love with her again and wanted to marry her again, you know? So it's, I think it makes sense that she felt and she was pleased that she went through with it because it confirmed to her that, yeah, this was the right decision. I mean, she waited a know? long time to get married. She was 43 years yeah, old. Right. She was dedicated to her classroom and to her students for, you know, probably almost 20 years if she was 43. I mean, she was right. out of college somewhere in her early 20s. Um, and she was satisfied with her life. And yet here it is, you know, you, you take those vows for better, or for worse, for richer, or for poorer in sickness and health. And to many people, I think we don't talk about it because we talk about the horrible, you know, the number of divorces and right. split families and everything else. But there are lots and lots of people who stand by their vows and end up taking care of each other or one taking care of the other more because they get sick because they do love each other and they've gone through thick and thin together. And that emotional bond is so very, very important to each of them. So many of us, I think, can relate to this in different ways. We either have parents that are aging, um, that we've, you know, witnessed go through this or that we will witness. We have grandparents that have gone through it, or maybe we're going through it ourselves, or we're approaching that stage in life where it's something that we're starting to think about. And that's one of those neat things is I think it's such a unifying thing. And when we can talk about stuff like this, you get a lot of different perspectives that you bring into play. We've got more to come. We're going to talk about uh, what the better alternative might be. Uh, to the assisted living situation um, and who it's right for. Uh, We're going to go over that again. So stick around. We've got lots more to come and we'll be right back. We are the state of us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. How not to grow old in America. That was the article we started with today from the New York Times. And it, uh, it caps its opening by saying the following. The problem is that for most of us, assisted living is a lie. And we're all complicit in keeping it alive. I think it sums it up pretty well. Um, note there, for most of us, for most of us is a lie. In other words, what we think of when we think of assisted living is this picture of a facility where people maintain some level of independence, but the facility provides some of the basic Mm -hmm. necessities. Um, And I think what we discovered in the second half of the show is there's a lot of forms of assisted living and they don't all involve going to a facility somewhere. Um, And part of the problem 
with a lot of people in these facilities, again, as this original article notes, is that most of them, most of them uh, require more care than the facility is designed to provide. Right. Most of the people in there need more care. And that's the whole reason we're having this conversation because, again, as it said, and we are all complicit in keeping it alive. Well, Lance and I don't want to be complicit anymore. Um, and that's why we're doing this episode. Exactly. And before we continue, Lance, it seems like the perfect time to mention True Chat's mission statement. Well, our mission statement is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. Okay. And education's up your alley, right? Right. That's Everything's all about education. Okay. Most of our solutions have some form of education in it. And that's what I think this is. Um, uh, you know, we talked about originally this all started out um, as people who could be mostly independent, but would prefer some of the basic things be taken care of. I don't have to worry about mowing the grass or trimming the hedges. I can live in a community where there's other people so I can be sociable. I don't have to make my meals. You know, taking away some of the things that um, for most of us, we spend a lot of time on right. in day-to-day -day life. And when you reach a certain age, you just don't want to, I mean, I don't know if anybody really wants to deal with those things, but, right. you know, but especially as you get older, you may not want to deal with them and they're probably harder to do. You know, they take more time, they take more effort. It's not that you can't do them. It's just that you'd prefer not to. And that's a very different picture from what a lot of people in assisted living um, are struggling with today. Exactly. And the problem is that a lot of families, I don't think, fully understand the scope of it. Uh, and this is a multi, you know, multi pronged issue. You've got the family, you've got the facility, and you've got what uh, the media and those of us out here that provide commentary on things are saying. And if you're raising your own family, you know, and, and we're not trying to attack any young families out there, but if you're raising your own family, it's like, where would I find time? to take care of my elderly loved ones. So I'm going to try to put them in a place where I think they're, I'm assuming they're getting the kind of care that I would like to give them, but I choose not to, or I don't feel like I can. I'm not that type of person. I'm not, I don't have that personality. And then I go visit them once a week or whatever. And then my whole being and self-worth is, is, okayed by myself when I can go on and thinking that my my parents are getting the care that I would like for them to have. And the reality is most of them are not right. getting the kind of care that we think they're getting when we put them in one of these facilities. And the problem is it's not, you know, it's not just the the motivation for them getting the care shouldn't be, and I, I don't think it is for most people, it shouldn't be your peace of mind. It ought to be what they need, what they deserve, what keeps them happy. I mean, that's, it they all deserve, comes down to what keeps them. Right. They deserve better care than I can give them. So I'm going to put them in this place so that they get treated because I want my mom and dad or my mom or dad treated as respectfully and as possible. Right. The problem is that then that often results in actually the opposite happening, which is them leading a worse life than they were before they had the care. Exactly. Um, because they, they don't have, and again, this isn't offloading it on the actual personnel who work in the facilities because most of them want to do a good job. It's they are overburdened with people who they shouldn't be trying to care for. Right. Because that's not their job. Right. You know, and, and a lot of times caring, they're not qualified. They're to caring individuals it. and they see somebody in need and they try to take care of it, but then it doesn't allow them to do the job that they were hired to do right. in taking care of. And other then you people. spend too much time, right, on one person and then everybody suffers. And then it creates what we have now, which is generally speaking, kind of an industry wide problem that assisted living doesn't have as great a reputation as it probably did mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Um, because it's becoming the lines are getting more and more gray between assisted living and nursing well, homes. Well, you use the word industry. So right. since it's now looked upon as an industry, then what becomes important is the bottom line and not patient care. Right. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. not, by, not by the people that are working there, but the business end takes over. For the, the investors who want their 15%. For the human end. Mm -hmm. So the the article, How Not to Grow Old in America, uh, poses a couple different ideas. One is perhaps the United States can learn from Japan, which is a few decades ahead of us in grappling with how to care for its rapidly aging population. Japan created a national long-term care insurance system that is mandatory. 
It is partly funded by the government, but also by payroll taxes and additional insurance premiums charged to people age 40 and older. It is a family-based, community-based system where the most popular services are heavily subsidized home help and adult daycare. Japanese families still use nursing homes and assisted living facilities, but the emphasis is on supporting the elder population at home. Um, Again, it shows that it's doable. Yeah. And I think it's a reflection of your society on how much you're willing to spend to take care of the young and the elderly. Because it is taxes, folks. Okay. I mean, it is taxes. But do you want to take care of people? Or do you not want to take care of people? And that's determines, you know, it's a direct image of the society in which you live. I truly believe that. Yep. And well, and I think the big thing is we did, I don't remember, this was probably like a year ago now, Lance, but I remember doing the piece on Japan about um, some of the programs they'd initiated to get young and old people. And when I say young, I mean like uh, early teens or preteens, mm-hmm. um, get them together that and, nine to 15 age range. Right. And engage in different community activities. And I think the idea of the reality is we spend a lot of money right now anyway on things like Medicare, you know, and social security. And if we were not so tied to these systems that are okay, <laughs> you know, they're yeah. all right. Right. Um, but they could be better. They're serviceable. And they may be able to be better and deliver better service for similar money. You know, if we look at what's spent on assisted living, how much of our taxes are devoted to Medicare programs, um, which is, I mean, a huge portion and social security, you add those two together and you have, um, I mean, they're in the top five budget items every right. year. Uh, and, well, and, and the point there is, we just too often we we box ourselves in and say, well, well, we can't get rid of Medicare and we can't get rid of Social Security. And it's well, it doesn't mean we have to get rid of them and do nothing better. Maybe, you know, these programs are many, many decades old now. And it's not that they didn't have their time and their place. But what what about something like what Japan's doing? You know, what would it cost? I don't know. But we need Congress, legislative, legislative. But the other side about bringing that. the young and the old together, that's just like bringing the races together. This is like bringing people of different, you know, young people think, well, why do I want to be around these old people? They're stinky and old and smelly. And, you know, and old people say, I don't want to be around these young people. All they care about is their phone and their loud music and blah, blah, blah. And then when you bring them together, they like, oh, wow, there's similarities. I learned how to play this game or, or I listened to music that this older person liked. And, and the young people infuse confidence and, Make older people want, you know, they have a friend and somebody to talk to and, well, or and, when we, and engage. When we went to Vancrest to do the, um, to do the campaign vent, I guarantee half of them looked at me and thought, Oh, well, he's a loud rocking, uh, music blaring teenager, an irresponsible teen. And then once I talked to him, once we started filling out the voter registration and update forms, they realized, Hey, this kid's all right. This kid is a great young man. And, and we're happy for And you realize that they that they were knowledgeable and interested in their community and still wanted to yeah. vote and still wanted to make the city a better place, even though and they hadn't they hadn't just given up and said, right. I'm at this place, I'm gonna live up I'm gonna give up and wait for so death. So both to take sides me. benefit when when you develop programs like this. The problem is And you make and you make the community better. Sorry. Just, no. I th- the whole thing that I'm glad you brought that up, Caleb, because the thing that was really interesting about this town hall that we did, all of them, were it really took some coaxing to get them because, the, and this is telling of our system in America. Now, granted, we're in one geographic area, you know, so this isn't everywhere, but they've become used to people not caring what they have to say. Mm-hmm. And that's a sad state of affairs. And after some continual attempts, to, we really do want you to, you know, talk to us. Yeah. Um, Tell there, her what it was like, what it was right. like for you, yeah. and what would you like to see in the future. There are a lot who then have an interest in sharing that once mm-hmm. they really genuinely believe that you actually care. Right. Um, but it was kind of this. There's this barrier that we had to overcome because of this expectation they have that we don't actually care. You know, um, we're saying it because it's what we're supposed to say. Um, and it's like, no, after you said it four or five times, oh, oh they really, they're these people really do care right. about us. They really want and our opinions. And I was there when. Um, 
Caleb was helping these three older ladies fill out. One of them needed an update for their voter registration because they'd moved into the facility recently. Mm -hmm. And the others were filling out their absentee ballots. Um, and they were done. And, you know, uh, she asked, you know, what Caleb was doing. And she, he said, you know, that's my boss. And she looked at me and she said, you have a good one here. Make sure to hold on to him. He's a very right. nice young man, you know, and that's that. Yeah. Little known fact. I have that on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good, you're a very nice young man. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got a good one you've here. You've got a good oh, one. Here. Nice young man. Yeah. Got a good one we got it. We can't forget the first part. First part makes it. So I don't know. I think that's to, to me, it all comes down to, you got to make sure that people are happy. And I think the way that we're doing it now, unfortunately, is leading to two things. People getting substandard care, um, not to a lack, not to the fault often of the people in the industry. And I mean, the people on the front lines, often not to their detriment, they're getting stuck with people they shouldn't have under their care, you right. know? Um, and often these facilities are understaffed and overcrowded. Um, and like Lance said, I think it speaks to the society. So it's, Definitely a serious problem. And the good news is places like Japan, you know, they figured it out and no, it's not perfect, but it's better than what we do. And this means a comprehensive, we have to get serious because Lance and I can't propose the specific exact best answer for us today. We don't have the resources, but that's why you need Congress to take this serious and say, we got to begin the effort to really study this and figure out what do we want to try? Well, you know, but again, what we're doing is not. But again, I'm going to argue. I'm going to disagree with you. Don't push it off on Congress. Search your own heart, mm -hmm. and let's make Congress do what we want to do. You know, let's let's take it to let's take it to heart and not push this off on somebody else. You know, yeah. and even if even if you don't have anybody, and I used to encourage my students to do this, take an hour out of your so-called busy week and go to a nursing home or an assisted living facility and just plop yourself down in the dining hall or in the communal living area and just sit there and talk to somebody or put a puzzle together with somebody or play a game with somebody and see, you know, you think, well, I'm going there to do them a service. And when you'll you be leave, surprised and when you leave, you find out that you got a whole lot more than you gave. Mm hmm. And, and that's where we need to start, you know, and I'm, I mean, I'm all about the government doing the right thing, but I think we as a society, and I, and I again refer to being taught as a five year old how to interact with an 80 year old woman and how I brought in her firewood and I did these things and she baked me cookies or fudge or whatever. And there was a mutual respect and friendship that grew. Mm -hmm. That when that lady died 30 years later at 115 or whatever she was, I took the time to write a letter to her 90-year-old son because Miss Pruitt had that kind of effect on my life. I mean, here I am, here I am 50 years later right. ta talking about her still remembering using her as an example. And she was just the elderly neighbor lady, you know, but she had a direct impact on my entire life as being one of wanting to serve people. Yep. It's, Sorry, I just had to get that in. Yeah. She's, there's a she, lot she's to one be of those offered, influential people in my life. And I thank my mom for pushing me because I, at five, I didn't want to go talk to this old lady. Right. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to mow her yard. You wanted to go play. I didn't want to haul in her yeah. firewood for her. You right. know, I didn't want to do those things, but it's just, those are things that we can do that we don't have to go to Congress. Yeah. And ask them to do it. Those are things we can do to make our society right now, today. a better place. Yep. Yeah. I think it's, like most things, there's it starts with a mindset shift and being educated on the situation. And then there's the things that we can do right now, uh, the things that we need to advocate for and make sure that those that are supposed to be uh, representing us are doing their job as well. Um, so because, uh, you know, it's it's there's a lot to be done, but it's certainly possible because there's other countries to do a much better job mm, than uh, we do than right. we do. Uh, so. Definitely take time to look at these articles. I think you'll see that they're very interesting, uh, very informative, and hopefully moving um, to help you change your mindset and spread the word, because that's what this is all about. That's what Lance and I do. The state of us org. Send people there to tune in. Lance, there's a lot of different ways that mm -hmm. people can invite others to listen. What are a few of those? Well, there's Stitcher, my personal favorite, Spotify. Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else fine podcasts are found. For the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. <laughs>